Pleasure to welcome our colleagues from Luxembourg. And last but not least, uh, the session is also uh, live streamed on internet, so we may have some YouTube viewers also joining us. So my name is Kuba Boratyński. Uh, I'm head of unit for cybersecurity and digital privacy policy, and it's my great honor and pleasure to to moderate uh, the last session of uh, Connect Summer University uh, devoted to cybersecurity. We are really happy, you know, that the subject, you know, got so much tracking also in that respect. So for today, uh, we have a, a very interesting lineup of speakers. Uh, the topics would be diverse, but they touch upon, you know, some of the critical challenges uh, for the future in the domain of, of, of cybersecurity and privacy. Um, I already spoke with, 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 with our panelists, so the idea is that each of them would speak for 20 minutes. We will have maybe a time for one or two questions right after, and, and then still time at the end for, 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 some, more, uh, for some more discussion. So, uh, we, uh, I would like, so I would like to, to first uh, present uh, to you uh, Paul Hofheinz, who is uh, the president and co-founder of, of the Lisbon Council, a uh, Brussels-based uh, think tank, uh, which actually has been, also, among many other topics, also venturing in the, in the area of, uh, of cybersecurity. Paul uh, has very diverse interests uh, related to the, to the digital uh, I would say reality, and uh, um, the title of, of your talk is Societal Security, uh, Steering Towards a Safer Digital Future. So, Paul, the floor is yours, and uh, share your insights, maybe surprise us. Okay, well, thank, thank you, thank you, Jakob. I may surprise you by not taking my full 20 minutes. Um, which I, I realize, of course, I'm entitled to, but I would prefer to go uh, straight to the point, uh, say what, I, what it is that I came here to say, and then we uh, go to the discussion and maybe can talk some more, because, of course, truth is not something that a lecturer has a monopoly on. Um, it's something that it, it's the, the conclusions are things we arrive at collectively, and I look forward um, uh, to that part of the day this morning. Look, I have a ground rule that I'm breaking here, which is never give a talk on a topic to people who know more about it than you do. Um, but uh, since you've invited me to speak about cybersecurity and since you've put me on a panel with so many distinguished experts, um, I'm going to have to break that. So what I'm saying is please uh, be kind to me when we get to the discussion. Um, what I do know a bit about uh, is politics, and I want to talk a bit about the politics of cybersecurity. And I can't help but starting uh, with a very brief discussion of what the events we've seen, the very dramatic events we've recently seen um, here in Brussels. Because I think uh, you, the civil service of the European Commission and Connect in particular, are in a very unique position now, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, look, it wasn't, uh, in, in my opinion, um, well, let me first of all say, I think the outcome of this process for the moment um, is, is pretty much okay. I don't have any large issues with the candidates who've been chosen. Uh, what we might object to is the way in which they were picked. And it wasn't a terribly... Um, clean, neat, or easy to explain process. In fact, uh, to the contrary, what I think the citizens of Europe saw, and I hope we saw this all in this room because it's what was going on, was the primacy of personality, jobs, um, and power over policy. Um, and that's problematic. It, it bothers me personally because I came to this dossier and to my work and to my time here in Brussels because policy was what interested me. Making a better life for the people of Europe is what interested me. Who the person sitting here or there interests me, frankly, not at all. What interests me a lot is what they're going to do, what they believe in, and what kind of consensus brought them there. And the odd thing about the situation we're in now is there's really not very much of a consensus. I haven't really seen anything terribly programmatic out there. Um, when Barroso came, he had some ideas. They might have been good ones, they might have been bad ones, I don't know, but everyone knew that a guy with with the political program was coming into office. Um, I don't have that feeling right now. I feel like it's all sort of wide open. And this is where I get to the point where I say, you guys are really important. Because 
Maybe Ursula von der Leyen knew something I didn't, but my impression is that 48 hours ago, she had no idea that she was likely to and about to become the president of the European Commission. Um, she's going to need help. She's going to need to get up to speed on a lot of dossiers very quickly. And even more to the point, she's going to need to cobble together a dossier and a program that's political enough to get her through this process, but ultimately effective enough to lead Europe. So it's a very good time. Um, in fact, you should all skip this meeting this morning, go back to your office and work on the memo to Commissioner X, uh, because the Commissioner X memos are going to have a larger than life presence um, in European politics going forward. Um, and please, I know you're all taking your job seriously, but take it really seriously this year, um, because they're going to be looking to you for ideas, um, for pedagogy. Um, we've all seen commissioners come in who didn't know very much about the dossier. What you're doing is very, very important right now. Now, politics. My colleague, uh, Lucas Ilvis, um, who actually knows a great deal more about cybersecurity than me, um, and for those of you who know Lucas, uh, recently became a dad uh, he, uh, one week ago, in fact. Um, we did a paper together um, on DSM 2.0 that um, is, by the way, much more eloquent than anything I'm going to have to say here this morning. And it was a particularly enjoyable paper to write because it was basically a long, extended conversation between Lucas and me as we, we actually did speak to a whole bunch of stakeholders and we heard a lot of ideas, but then it fell to us to make sense of them and put them down in paper. And as we talked through various issues, we tried to find what we thought was the, the right spot um, politically and technically on some of these dossiers. And I only want to talk about one small part of the paper, um, which in particular um, touches on cybersecurity. Um, one of the very first issues that we dealt with was, do we need to recommend treaty change? And prima facie, we didn't want to, because who on earth wants to open up the treaty? I mean, that kind of process is long, difficult, and and it can it can take time, and it can become a ginormous distraction. We've 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 seen that. We have experience with that. But after analyzing the situation, we thought there were two areas where perhaps the treaties did need to be opened, um, because they were areas where priority European action was needed, and the treaty perhaps didn't give enough competences uh, to the Commission and the institutions to act in that area. And the first area was on skills. And let me just say, I don't know if anyone in this room has a particular life course that I have, but I, 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 for 15 years I've been hearing about this, that we don't have skills, we don't have enough skills, we have a digital divide. I have to say I had a quick look at DESI, which I hope you've all uh, digested in, in, in detail. Um, and it's a little bit shocking, actually, because we all know we have a digital divide. I'm not sure people realize how large it is. We, we have some of the most digital societies in the world in Scandinavia, I mean, 90% of the people there are, are going online. And we have other areas where less than half of the population is able to go online, even for basic functions. One of them is, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, Italy. Um, this, this really is not sustainable long term. And we sort of know that. But we allow ourselves to discuss it at conferences. And then the discussion just kind of ends there. We have a skills coalition. And we have various initiatives, all of which are nice and useful and helpful. We have nothing against them, but they're not systemic and they don't really go with the core and the heart and the crux of the problem. So what we said was the new European commissioner and the president themselves should have a policy every European digital. And it needs resources and structure. And if your answer back to me is, well, we don't have competences in that area, my answer is, well, go out and get them. Because we go out and get competences all the time. You saw this in the financial crisis. When there's an emergency, we go out and figure it out. And I actually think uh, that this would be met with a great deal of sympathy at the higher level politically, if it were done in the right way. So the first area for treaty change is that we need a major initiative on skills, um, and the commission and the institutions need to get power. The other area was cybersecurity. Um, because I think our response there, as, as important as it is, and impressive in its own way as it is, uh, is still not quite up to the size of the problem that we encounter on cybersecurity now. Um, first and foremost, um, from hostile state actors, I'm, I'm a little amazed we still mess around a little bit with this. There's, it's kind of all seen as, oh, it's the internet, and what are we going to do about it? And let's have some conferences on that. Um, we have state actors out there who are using digital technology to undermine our democracy um, and with, e with enormous effect. I, I, I mean, this isn't, I'm not talking about a small plot here. Or there. This is a big thing. And, and our response 
has to be robust. Um, look, the ANISA mandate, um, the NIS directive, all these things are fine. After discussing this, Lucas and I thought, well, let's just put it on the table. Can't we federalize this? Can't we create an agency? I mean, there, there's a there's a longstanding discussion um, in Europe in European politics. All of you know the question of where there should be more Europe and where less. And if you look at it in that context, where there should be more Europe, I would argue that cybersecurity has a place right alongside competition and trade. It's an area where pooling our resources makes sense. It's an area where we, we could do much better if we pooled our resources. And it's also an area where I think, frankly, we need to do much better. So, um, you know, in ESA, we're all for it. Um, but we actually think there should be something more muscular at the European level, federalized powers. And by the way, we shouldn't be shy about it. It's the kind of thing, and this was actually it helps me with the second point I wanted to make, is that it's the kind of thing that, a, that an incoming commission should be doing. Let me, let, and let me say why. Um, I think politics at its most basic level, um, and, and by this I mean policy, it, it needs to work on two levels. Every policy needs to work on two levels. The first one is it needs to make sense to everybody. You have a perfect policy, and if it doesn't make sense, it's going nowhere. So it needs to be easy to explain, easy to sign on to, able to command a majority in the demos, which of course means the European Parliament. But by the way, they're not the beginning and the end of the world. There's a lot of other stakeholders out there. They're the member states. Um, it needs to make sense. And whatever policy it is that makes sense needs to work on a technical level. And that's where it gets very complicated because it has to be able to fly politically and it has to be able to deliver results. And my, my argument on cybersecurity would be that this is an area where it can be made to work on both levels, possibly not with existing arrangements, because I'm arguing that we need something more muscular there. But we need, we need to go to people and tell them that we're fighting this. I, I, I will get around now to my final point, which is about trust. Um, every, everyone's very worried. And, and we've let the debate get a little bit muddled. I mean, we had a, we had a gigantic um, effort on data privacy, which I, I think um, going from this moment forward and looking back, I, I think everyone in the world, even Mark Zuckerberg, by the way, everyone in the world agrees the Europeans won on this. I mean, they're, they're basically, that debate is, is over now. The European framework, whatever problems there might be here or there with it, is accepted. As, a, as an excellent model and a very good starting point for this discussion going forward. So congratulations, well done. Um, <laughs> but, and you, know, you made me forget what I, what I was, what, I, what, were, what were we talking about before I started talking about Mark Zuckerberg? Uh, Trust comparative privacy. Yeah, look, we, we basically won that, won that debate. And, and, oh yeah, now I remember. But, but the outcome is a situation at the ground level in Europe where powers aren't really evenly distributed. And what do I mean by that? We, we have 51 data protection supervisors. And by the way, the reason I say we have 51 is we counted. There's, of course, one in each member state, 15 at each Ger German lender. Uh, the Spanish have five. Uh, or I'm sorry, the British have five. The Spanish have three, plus the European one. It adds up to 51. Um, that's an awful lot of regulatory power, and that's fine. But I'm missing that on Anisa, you know, moving is opening an office in Athens. I, I don't I, I, I feel like we've 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 lulled ourselves into a false sense of security that because we were doing so much on data privacy, we were also doing enough on cybersecurity. And the issues are related. I mean, if you look at them from a citizen's point of view, having their data stolen is at least as serious as breach, and I would argue probably more so, because if someone is stealing your data, they're probably trying to get your credit card. Who knows? Um, but we, we have a false sense of security around cybersecurity because of our robust stance on data privacy. And I think going forward, that's something we not only need to address, but we need to address vocally and in a public context with policies that also work technically. That's what I was trying to say a moment ago. And maybe I just, there were one or two other things I, I wanted to mention um, on GDPR. Um, it's fine. It's only... It's only the first step, and we need to now think about the regulatory environment of a post-GDPR world. Um, and I'm missing a little bit, a lot of reflection, or even really some basic reflection on that. Um, an exception there is the government of Finland, which, by the way, has the current presidency. There's some very interesting projects going on in Finland 
essentially about how we build the data economy post-GDPR. Um, because there are a lot of things there that we haven't yet figured out, among them most notably and difficultly how we manage consent. How we manage consent in a way where there continues to be privacy, but the data economy itself can, can, um, can develop. Uh, the Finns have a very interesting project that CITRA has led on uh, called IHAND, which is a, a Finnish acronym. By the way, they might have given it a different, it's a Finnish acronym for, for human-centered data economy. I don't know enough Finnish to know how they get to IHAND from that. Um, but it's, it's actually quite clever, um, as, as, as a lot of the technical Finnish work is. Um, and to the extent that I can understand it, um, it's, a, it's a series of protocols, a series of common definitions, and the big innovation there is on identifiers, that they basically think there need to be flexible and robust identifiers that don't simply identify the personal um, ownership of the data, but that in addition to that can identify which data sets that data belongs in, and there's a consent process attached to that too, so that we could give broader consent uh, for the use of our data uh, without um, slowing the entire data economy down. It's a primitive idea. It's an early idea. Um, one of the reasons I mention it is I'm hoping you guys will grab it and run with it because the post-GDPR data economy uh, is crying out for treatment in the incoming uh, commission. Uh, whether they've figured that out or not yet, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's tremendously important. And I think maybe on that note, I'll just stop and say I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm particularly looking forward to the interventions because I think you know this topic uh, much better than me. Um, and whatever comes of this, um, you know, we're here to serve. Uh, we're here to serve the people of Europe. And, and we owe them better on cybersecurity. And we owe them a stronger sense uh, that we understand that they're being messed with. It's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough, tough world out there. And this is an area where, that they're looking to us to fix. And on that note, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. I, I mean, you're uh, indeed right. We are at a very interesting moment, the period of transition. I can assure you that there are so many colleagues in the room because, I mean, we've done most of work uh, in terms of, you know, providing and developing ideas for the new college. I mean, irrespective of, of who, you know, th that work is being done without knowing, obviously, who is uh, f finally uh, appointed Commission President. Uh, but indeed, this is a moment when we are very much interested in ideas. And I mean, what you what you have been doing, and I will try not to abuse my, my privilege as a moderator, that uh, you want a more muscular, uh, muscular approach. Uh, I, I can tell you that, uh, yeah, we have been sort of working toward this, but... Uh, uh, maybe this is like a, a view of uh, too conservative commission official. We need these voices from the outside, but also when you are inside, you see that actually we have really to digest what we have announced, uh, passed on as legislation, and um, I'm, I'm honestly quite often afraid of us kind of running to the big next thing without really capitalizing on, on what, what, what has been done. And when we speak about NIS, maybe it sounds like uh, things of the past, but... Uh, it is actually now that there are changes on the ground happening in member states, only now, because it, the, the cycle is basically so long. You know, you adopt a directive after three years of negotiations, and then you, uh, you, you have another two years, where one, and only then actually things are starting to move. The same is with ENISA. Um, but I think this is very much important that, that to have in mind the, the, this perspective from the outside. Um, okay, I'm not entirely clear what type of treaty change you you you, you have in mind but I cybersecurity ah, okay federalized <laughs> cybersecurity but now I, if, if there is any like one or two questions before we move to the next speaker from the floor I'd be happy to take it up please Gregor Schaffrat, ESTC. Um, thank you very much for your words. Um, there's one thing I would like to mention on this uh, uh, with respect to the idea of classifying data in data sets, um, the privacy concerns, from my perspective, do not um, are not reflected in properties of the data, but actually in analysis contexts. It always depends under which perspective I combine what data and then some uh, uh, actually uh, a set of very innocuous data um, items may actually yield some additional insight I did not want to be made or to be assumed. This was 
just more a comment. Anyone, anyone else would like to take the floor now? Okay. If not, I suggest we come to the next speaker and we will... <laughs> yes? But that is really an open one because um, the, the question that attaches it, uh, itself to this is um, how do you address that in a regulatory uh, uh, way? Because um, it seems to be more or less the easy approach of labeling data as either personal data or not personal data, privacy relevant or not privacy relevant. Um, but I would deem it very hard to come up with an enumeration of all of the possible um, evaluation or analysis uh, um, contexts that I could figure one might apply to a data item. So annotation of this data, I'm afraid, probably becomes impractical at some point. Um, so the question would be, um, do you see any way of addressing that in a regulatory way in the analysis context? Two things. I, first of all, I want to say um, I have a really easy job. I can just sort of come in here and tell you guys a bunch of things, and then I'm going to go back to my office and answer my email. Um, it's much easier to be a think tanker than a regulator or a, or a policymaker. Um, so I don't really have clear, precise, and crisp answers to your questions. But maybe, Jakob, I go to your question, uh, which I half answered sort of falsely now. Um, what treaty changes are, am I suggesting? It's that we federalize uh, cybersecurity. Of course, we know that uh, the directive's in midstream, and it's, I guess, the privilege of my position that I can walk in here and make it sound like it's easy. Um, it's obviously not. Um, and we, we, we very much support um, your work in that area and, and wish you success and speed with it. Um, on your question, um, my answer is more or less the same. I don't know. But what I'm trying to suggest is we had a long, very difficult, very emotional discussion about GDPR. It lasted the better part of a decade, and it kind of exhausted everyone. And no one has been thinking about what's next. And that's the part we need to think about now. And the questions are somewhere in the realm of the one you asked, which is where those lines of privacy might or might not lie, um, and how we essentially don't let this legislation be used to shut down the data economy, because I think that there's an enormous, there are enormously important things going on in the data economy, and we're going to need to figure out a way to make all these things happen. By the way, the standard cliche, as long as we're in the realm of politics rather than the technical realm, is that this will be a competitive advantage for Europe, that, that uh, GDPR, we're going to build businesses around privacy. And that may or may not be the case. I haven't seen it yet. Um, and my point is, this is where our work is. Now, the role of regulation or regulators, I don't know. The one thing I do know, your role is to be involved in this discussion, and I appreciate your question. Um, whether regulation is the answer to it at the end of the day is a different matter or not, but everyone's listening to you and everyone knows the power you have. So get involved and go talk to the Finnish colleagues about it because they're thinking really, uh, really hard about it. They have a long experience there with my data um, and the my data movement. Uh, issues of data privacy are not new to them, and neither are issues of the data economy. So we need to bring these dossiers together somehow in a way that works. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our uh, Jordanka, who is our, our our speaker, and she would focus on privacy issues. She may also refer to the to the points uh, that we have raised. Uh, now uh, let me turn to to our next speaker. Uh, Fred, Frederick uh, Binander is uh, an associate professor of political science and director for Center for Societal Security. Uh, he also uh, was working for, for, for the Swedish government in, in relation to, to, to crisis coordination and hybrid uh, threats. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, this is the, the issue, the, generally, the question of, of, of hybrid threats. Uh, has really entered into sort of mainstream of, 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 of policy discussions at, at European level. Uh, we know what, what was the trigger. The trigger were clearly the, the events uh, in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine uh, back in uh, back in 2014. Uh, since then, we hear we see quite an impressive movement. I mean, on, on uh, from, from from a number of member states as well. I would say particularly Baltic countries and and Nordic uh, Nordic countries have a. Let's say strong have 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 worked very hard to 
put it at the, at the let's say, the heart of European agenda. Cyber is definitely part of, of, of hybrid. Again, from my sort of small corner, yeah, we, 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 on the other hand, we also a bit grapple, you know, how we can, in a sort of meaningful way, contribute by tying together these different types of, of, of responses. But again, we have, a, we have a great expert with us, so the floor is yours, Frederick. Well, thank you, Jakob. And um, I have to say, you blew my cover. You said my name right, so uh, my undercover oh. name here doesn't work anymore. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, my approach to this, I, and pretty much like Paul, I'm a policy person, so don't ask me about the technical details because I won't be able to answer. Um, what we look at at my, my center at the Swedish Defense University is really the intersection between defense and security. Uh, in this case, cyber defense, cyber security. And we do believe that you can't have one without the other. Uh, they have been separate domains uh, for a lot of different reasons. Our signal intelligence services have been monopolizing part of this and saying nobody else needs to you know, get involved. We know what we're doing. And this is not a tenable situation anymore because the systems that we're all operating in are the same. Um, military organizations do have some of their own um, gizmos, uh, but you know they're all based on these large societal systems. So even they start to realize now that, hey, we need other organization entities, we need other parts of government, we need industry on board in order to be able to do our job. Um, and then they face the same dilemma as uh, we've all been facing for a long time. Uh, so there are vulner vulnerabilities in these systems, and uh, these are really what drives failures of integrity, whether it's uh, private integrity or system integrity, government integrity. And all these measures to provide security are not the real problem, but this is what much of the political uh, debate is about. Um, so, uh, back to the thing about hybrid warfare then. Um, the hybrid threat is really about trying to contextualize the different things that can happen to our society. Uh, and, you know, taking each and every one in isolation doesn't really help us. When we start thinking about what should be the measures that we plan for, uh, how should we keep these systems running, and how should we keep adversaries, whether they're states or hackers or criminal organizations, out of those systems, trying not to have them manipulate them. And, and speaking about hybrid is really about having threats that will use different domains, you know, find our vulnerabilities, play to their own strengths. And obviously, cyber is an increasingly important tool in that toolbox for most of the type of threat actors that, that we can think about. So uh, in terms of defining things, I think hybrid warfare is the act of forcing your will on an adversary with no or only marginal use of armed violence, you know, conventional military forces, all that stuff, guns and, and you know, so if you can use other means, they're going to probably be cheaper. They're not going to be as detectable. People won't really know that it's you who are doing some of these things. And cyber is obviously sort of the tool of choice for a lot of these actors, and increasingly so. But they are not the only ones. And when we think that we could just isolate this area and talk about this as its own type of problem, I think we're fooling ourselves. Because not only do these actors that are attacking us every day across the board in terms of our different critical systems, use these different domains to do it. We also need to use all those domains to protect ourselves. So the means, whether you're an attacker or a defender in this uh, you know, simplified kind of sense, they include things like diplomacy, influence operations, psychological warfare, maneuvering international institutions, of which the European Union uh, would be one. Um, cyber is obvious, but, um, you know, financial tools. There are so many different things that you can use, and you can use them in concert. You can use one area to force more vulnerability in, in another when you're actually targeting 
a state or, or a system or an institution. And when you're defending it th against this, you also have to play to your own strengths. And this is becoming ever more obvious. I'm going to take an example outside of, of the immediate cyber arena. Look at what happened in, in Salisbury, uh, the poisoning of the Skripals. Uh, this is obviously not a cyber operation. This is classic old-fashioned using biological weapons on foreign soil to do something to a person of interest. Um, the way that the UK government and its institutions handled this was by uh, looking into it in an investigation, doing attribution by advanced forensic uh, processes. Uh, the Port and Down laboratories in England figured out that this was actually Novichok. Uh, there are only so many actors that we can you know, reasonably assume would have access to this. And so narrowing down uh, the number of possible culprits. And then doing something else, using their alliances, using their legitimacy in international diplomacy to actually start doing something, to introduce consequences uh, to the culprits of this attack. And I think there are parallels here. I think that in terms of cyber, we can think of this in the same sense, detection, attribution, and then using, playing to our strengths in terms of how do we uh, enforce consequences to whoever it is that are targeting, targeting our system and undermining our, our interest, whether national or union interest or whatever. Uh, another problem, and for you this is obvious, is that when we talk about cyber as a threat vector, it's usually the singular cyber attack that kills people and, you know, ruins material infrastructure, and it's very obvious and, and material. Um, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, uh, hybrid, hybrid threats, we need to see cyber much more as a force multiplier. Obviously, there can be attacks that will do stuff to us, and there's nothing else going on. But even so, we can't be sitting back and just doing the cyber thing. We need to be thinking, what else is going on? Why are they doing this now? Who is trying to come after, you know, the goodies in the bag? So the force multiplier thing, I think, is important. Uh, and it makes other hybrid tools more effective. That's the sort of meaning of this. Um, you know, it denies the state, the system, the union, uh, its societal functionality in trying to come up with a response. So if you're trying to influence somebody's election and you hit them with a major cyber attack, you're also going to do influence operations at the same time, right? Because you would be a fool otherwise. And the thing is that, you know, the, the weaknesses that are exploited are going to play into this, this situation. Um, so, um, I just saw this nice little pamphlet uh, that um, uh, DG Connect has out, Building Strong Cybersecurity in the European Union, and it says Resilience, Deterrence, and Defense. And I think that, you know, we've done a good job recently. I think the Brits started this by sort of resuscitating deterrence as a active policy measure. Deterrence for a long time at the end of the Cold War was about nuclear arms and, you know, how big missiles did you have? That's not really what the concept is about. Deterrence is about making it costly to attack you, making it costly to be inside your vital systems and try to manipulate um, the uh, sort of democratic um, frameworks and so forth. So um, it's a sustained effort to making attacks um, by the adversary costly, risky, and ineffective. And we need a lot of tools in order to deter these kind of attacks on us. Um, we need to be resilient, obviously, and we spend so much time trying to become more resilient, and it's a good thing. Um, but it's not enough. Um, the resilience of critical system uh, is a necessary, I would say, but not sufficient condition for deterrence. And there are a lot of problems here. Uh, for example, our, our procurement um, uh, processes 
I don't think we use our security uh, options in terms of this enough. I think a lot of the weaknesses are because we are so systematic and sometimes bureaucratic in the way that we implement some of these systems that it hurts us in that area. But when we're talking about imposing consequences on attackers, wherever they come from, um, you know, and their sponsors, because that's also what we're talking about, um, it is also uh, important, and you all know this, to make our IT systems hostile environment for these attackers. And so we got all this stuff that we need to do. We need to detect uh, things. And then we get to attribution. And I, I, everybody knows this is one of the main problems. It's one of the hardest things to do. There are so many ways to hide. There are so many hidden hands in all this. But I think that if there's one thing that we need to put more resources, money, skills, all that stuff into, it's really you know getting better at attribution because Going back to what I was saying about, you know, hybrid threats and playing to your own strengths, this really plays into the strength of most European Union countries, the West, if you will, because this is about, you know, upholding uh, the moral high ground. It's about using international law. It's about using our standing in diplomatic international institutions in order to shame or even legally sort of get at some of these attackers. And it's about showing that not only once, but in a systematic effort, is this going on and here's the culprit. And I think that, you know, this is the thing that we're good at if we can only get a, a bit better at also the attribution side. So I think, you know, we should have forensic labs of the exact same type as Porton Down all over the European Union in terms of doing this. And it should not only be sort of government uh, sponsored, it should not only be sort of EU, although we need all those type of, of uh, organizations, but we also need industry to take care of their own stuff and be a bit more open about what is going on because it does have a security impl uh, implications. And, and we do have an interest in making industry uh, play along here. And finally, I do think that we need some offensive capabilities as well. And a lot of, a lot of the member states, and especially um, if we're talking about the, the United States, the UK are really ramping up uh, all kinds of offensive capabilities in the cyber domain. Um, I think that, you know, very prudently we're being careful because this is, I said that one of our sort of main strength is upholding legitimacy in what we're doing in this domain, you know, using offensive capabilities without, you know, um, um, applying international law and so forth would be, would be undercutting this, this uh, legitimacy. So I think um, uh, to sum up, I think this cross-domain thinking needs to be around. I don't think every sort of cyber uh, capability around here needs to think about this all the time, but we need to have this much more coherent picture in terms of how we deal with also the, the sort of narrow cyber threats, because there are other things, and in, in the worst case, these are concerted efforts to do things that are not only constrained to the cyber uh, arena. So thank you. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, for this very interesting uh, insights into, into the challenges created by hybrid threats and the way we can actually tackle cyber. Just very, very, very brief comments on my side. I mean, uh, the, you, you write and, yeah, you, indeed you, you notice that deterrence became part of, let's say, also EU approach to, to, to cyber security, which is in a way less obvious. I mean, and I think... The, the question that we are facing here is that, well, resilience measures are, let's say, fully in line with the basically internal market strong competences of the union, because after all, through resilience, you, you basically make uh, companies, you make governments resilience against all sorts of threats. And by the way, we always tend to forget that when we talk about cyber, it is not just about attacks. Some of the most cyber, most serious and, 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 and fatal cyber incidents are not result of any 
uh, action of any malicious actor, but just simply a result of, I don't know, lazy IT stuff or just lack of, lack of proper diligence and, and uh, in, in, in the way uh, systems are being managed and updated. Nevertheless, resilience is, we do resilience, it's, it's kind of a, a non-disputed area. In the area of deterrence, you know, when, when, when we speak about attribution, I think what we see is that with more uh, tools available, uh, indeed, you can technically find out who is, who is behind the attack. But then if you are talking about deterrence, the question comes, so what? Okay, are, we, are member states ready to jointly attribute um, uh, certain attack to a major power with whom we have a lot of complex relations and a lot is at stake. Even that, you know, what type of measures? We have this very, I think, important achievement that is a cyber, this a diplomatic toolbox uh, where indeed, you know, EU can resort even to sanctions, to different types of res restrictive measures. Again, in practice, it is, it is, it is very difficult. And so I think that the, indeed the challenge for the future is how to make um, this deterrence possible. And again, if, even if you go even further talking about offensive cap capabilities, that is far, far, far any sort of existing uh, competence, EU competence at, the, at this stage. I mean, nevertheless, it still makes sense to talk about it at European level. And uh, if not to use the hard power of the Union, at least, you know, use the powers of, of convening and, and, and bringing member states together where they can learn from each other. Okay, I would stop here. Are there any comments or questions from the floor? Maybe in Luxembourg? No. no, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, we uh, uh, so let's move then to the to the next speaker. Uh, we will uh, uh, have now uh, Jordanka uh, Ivanova, who is a practicing lawyer uh, as well as working on PhD uh, in in the area of uh, GPR and its applications in the context of big data and artificial intelligence. Um, so, uh, Jordanka, so we are now, the time, the floor is yours, and, and indeed tell us about the challenges that, that the privacy and, uh, to, 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 and other fundamental rights in the context of the new technologies in particular. Um, thank you very much, and uh, is it working? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everyone from me as well. And it's a great opportunity to be a presenter in front of so many officials uh, who are shaping the EU policy in times of this ongoing uh, digital transformation. So my talk today uh, is indeed for the challenges to privacy and other fundamental rights in the algorithmic and big data world we are predominantly living in. And similar to Paul, I also have the problem also to be a presenter to you who may be much more knowledgeable on artificial intelligence and big data as you are in fact defining uh, the EU action uh, in this area. So please pardon me, uh, uh, all the technical uh, details. Uh, so, and I also have to make the disclaimer that I really focus on the legal issues and more on the fundamental mental rights uh, perspective, as these are also issues I believe important for you as EU officials who have to respect the EU fundamental uh, charter where all these rights uh, are enshrined when you are writing all the policy and legislative actions. Um, so just to start by saying that indeed they are in the really, really uh, major economic and uh, social benefits uh, that these technologies could bring. And we have to find the way how to design and use them in a way that could be both uh, privacy and fundamental rights friendly and also economically efficient. As uh, AI um, really will be the game changer uh, with uh, the fourth industrial revolution. At the same time, what I'm going to focus now are more importantly the risks. 
that these new technologies uh, pose to the fundamental rights. And these are, of course, the risks of dual usage, as uh, we saw that these technologies could be in the hands of backed actors. But even with all the good intentions we have today, they could, um, in fact, uh, pose risks if those problems uh, that are inherent to the technologies are not addressed at this early stage. And these are risks to the fundamental rights, but also to wider values um, such as democracy, justice, uh, etc. And um, looking into what are, in fact, the challenges and why AI is so different as a technology and related to other areas, um, I've here just mentioned some of them, and these are, we, we have to make, uh, of course, the caveat that uh, AI is understood very broadly and it covers many types of technologies, but the most uh, used now, uh, deep learning, machine learning, just have uh, several challenges uh, today. And the first one is the black box uh, phenomenon and the opacity in which the algorithms work, as they are really capturing multiple patterns that cannot be explained in single equation, and they remain highly, um, highly incomprehensible to humans and even to the, their developers. So researchers are working hard to find solution for explainable AI, as otherwise we really can trust the decision it makes, and most importantly, we cannot hold it accountable. And the other really uh, big challenge is that AI is becoming autonomous and there are more and more decisions with the sophistication of the technology that will be attributed to be taken by these algorithms. Um, there are, of course, uh, contexts, different <coughs> contexts, but we, uh, it's really important that humans remain under control. And um, uh, in fact, accountability and transparency are both challenging because complexity of the algorithms is really increasing and they interact with many different systems, many data sets, uh, and also really in highly dynamic situation and real time. And the algorithms are also continuously changing and learning. So uh, this requires constant uh, vigilance. They are also highly unpredictable. So, um, in fact, uh, this can be quite a big advantage in using big data analytics, as we can extract value and bring uh, benefits to the economies. But this could also bring sometimes unexpected or even unwanted results um, sometimes. They also act on the basis of statistical probability. And uh, in this case, there are always error rates. So there have been enormous improvements uh, in some areas, but in others, there are still uh, a lot of challenges. And um, in fact, um, these error rates are quite significantly different for different groups, especially minorities. Um, and uh, this could be really considered when using them. And this problem is also related to the biases, which are um, embedded in the AI, just because it is created by humans and it, it is also trained on historic, often unrepresentative data. There are biases embedded, but even if the training and the system is good, uh, they also have uh, self-reflecting feedback loops. And they just uh, exposing and reproducing existing biases and inequalities uh, that are uh, in our um, society. Uh, which can really lead to uh, enforcing the discrimination uh, and already other problems. Uh, but there are also problems beyond, um, in fact, uh, bias. And even when the, correct, uh, the predictions are correct, uh, this may uh, be quite unfair sometimes to use them, as we had the case, of course, with Cambridge Analytica, but even with China, with its social scoring system, or even the use of facial recognition technology that now starts to be massively used also in some countries. Um, so what are the risks, in fact, posed by these technologies to privacy? And um, personal data is used in several different stages. First, we have the training data, which is often biased and of bad quality. And we still need a lot of training data to fix those problems. Uh, so this is a challenge, I think, that we also, if we want to become a trustworthy AI, we have to address. Then we have also the input data, which comes usually from big data sources, and it may not be really relevant, 
or necessary for the decision making uh, that the AI is processing. We have the AI reasoning itself, <coughs> which as we said before, remains rather opaque and may often repurpose the data from its original context. So this may be also linked uh, to the question of uh, the colleague who said that indeed all these large data sets are so many reused in so many different contexts which comes in the end with output data and inferences or predictions made about us as individuals, which may, may be correct or wrong, but they are also often, often unknown to the individual. So if I can give you an example, um, input data just as innocuous as location or just a couple of Facebook likes can show, in fact, your race, your health, your sexual orientation, uh, or political affiliations. So all these data as input inferences can be used in quite harmful ways, uh, as we already saw, and can undermine democracy, rule of law, uh, and many uh, other major values. So we have, in fact, quite some important interferences with our privacy and data protection with the use of these technologies. And we cannot escape the mass surveillance which has come with the digital revolution. Uh, all this data uh, we leave uh, is collected, uh, analyzed, aggregated with many other sources. And in fact, it's used in the end often to profile us or to score us, and then to uh, really take sometimes uh, automated decisions by algorithms, whether we are suitable for a job or to be admitted in the university. Um, and many other life-changing decisions, even whether to be arrested. We can be also micro-targeted with um, tailored messages uh, or, um, uh, yes, which could uh, in the end be quite uh, uh, potentially nudging us or manipulating us. And there is also the, the risk, the growing risk of re-identification of the data as AI is really powerful today to make the correlations from different uh, data sets and the distinction between personal and non-personal data is uh, decreasing. It's also almost impossible and an illusion to delete the data once it's out there in the digital space and it is indeed repurposed for many, many different contexts and my, by many, many other entities that we're not so aware. And finally, we also have the growing risks to security breaches, um, which makes security really an essential component to ensure data and digital privacy, something that also uh, the other colleagues said. But digital privacy and data protection play also instrumental role for the protection of many other fundamental rights that are protected by the Charter. And here we have also non-discrimination, um, as AI uh, may reproduce existing biases, but also create new ones, as we said, with the segmentation uh, that it creates sometimes. Dignity by affecting our autonomy and self-determination, freedom of expression, assembly and association, um, with the chilling effect of mass surveillance or filter bubbles, integrity, right to free movement uh, with GPS and facial recognition, which allows uh, AI to locate individuals in real time, predict their movement or restrict it, the right to life risks posed by self-driving vehicles and autonomous weapons, free elections, as we saw with Cambridge Analytical and fake news, liberty and presumption of innocence with the predictive policing, due process and effective remedies, where we don't know the basis on which decisions are taken and we cannot challenge them sometimes, rights of protected groups and social rights. So what are the instruments today we have in Europe to address those rights? Of course, we have the best data protection legislation globally. And this is the GDPR with which we all should be very proud. But here we see also the very, very positive side and some of still the gaps and challenges, how in fact GDPR, whether it is sufficient to safeguard us against those risks. We have greater protection and consistency with increased powers of the supervisory bodies, but at the same time, one year later, we see that we have a lot of the outright privacy abuses in the digital space still going on. So the regulators, uh, maybe some where the, the biggest digital companies are located, are not 
probably doing their job sufficiently good. And we really need stronger enforcement to benefit uh, from all those protection and rights we have. We have also legally enforceable rights as individuals uh, for control of our data. Uh, but there are also power and information imbalances to enforce these rights. And most importantly, there are competing interests as trade secrets for the companies, uh, which uh, often prevent uh, individuals from benefiting from them. And it's also not very cl clear whether the inferences, in fact, that those algorithms make uh, about us uh, are protected at all by this legislation. Um, as there is a um, different interpretation given by the court in previous cases. We have also some principle-based and very flexible and technology-neutral obligations that could address many of the challenges uh, highlighted before, the purpose limitation, transparency, fairness, accuracy, security, accountability. But uh, at the same time, they are really high level and there is a, a great degree of legal uncertainty for controllers how the new obligations will be applied in practice by the data protection authorities. Uh, how compatible can be the reuse? Is there really a right to an explanation to an automated decision? What is expected, in fact, to ensure fair and accountable AI? So we all don't know the answers to all these questions, and we may need more specific uh, guidance in the context of AI and big data. We also have, with the GDPR, the forward-looking uh, forward uh, risk-based approach, which is great. Um, but at the same time, we have uh, several different interpretations by data protection authorities what risks should be addressed, and they focus mainly on only on security and accuracy, leaving the rest. And the by design approach, which could really influence the design of these technologies, it's not really certain whether it can be directly enforced against uh, AI uh, and model developers and designers. Um, GDPR makes also another big, very important change that now it aims to protect all fundamental rights and not only privacy. And this is a major achievement. Uh, this has also important implications for the requirements for automated decision making and also the data the data protection impact assessment, uh, and these are very, very important uh, uh, new requirements that could protect us to, against the risks. But still, there is also certain uh, limitation of the scope and protection. Only personal data and data processing uh, is covered in this case, not, not non-personal data. We also don't know what is similar and legally significant effect, solely automated, and there is also insufficient consideration of the collective dimension and ethical considerations. So all this could be probably fixed by sectoral legislations. And we also have now the EU ethical guidelines on trustworthy AI, which is a great piece of document uh, addressing many of the problems above. But it uh, created by the high-level expert group with very renowned experts. But it also has uh, its limitations. And this principle-based and flexible um, uh, changes uh, and obligations for AI, at the same time, we don't really have comprehensive understanding how the ethical obligations correspond to the existing legal obligations under existing clause, as we have many in this case. They also address the ethical and social dimension in addition to the legal obligations, but they are not adopted by the Commission. Uh, and in this case, they couldn't be used by the Court of Justice to interpret the missing gaps, as they are not a legal act uh, of the EU in the end. Uh, we also have the light touch self-regulation and human rights-based approach, but the Court of Justice has said also that sometimes self-regulation may not be sufficient to protect fundamental rights and essential interests, uh, and we may need harder uh, rules for this. Uh, and the lack of enforcement power may also um, just limit uh, its ability to become a global standard the way that uh, GDPR became. So. We have, uh, in fact, quite good starting point, but some preliminary conclusions could be that 
Still, at this moment, uh, GDPR and the ethical guidelines are both very necessary, but they may not be really sufficient, probably, to safeguard uh, uh, against the risks for the society and the fundamental rights uh, posed by the, um, these uh, technologies. And here, to fill the gaps, uh, very important will be the interpretation that will be given by the Court of Justice, as many of the deficiencies could be compensated. Um, still, for, there may be also need for more detailed rules for AI, very highly risky applications with various options here I have shown, proposed now in the literature, for example, carrying out uh, algorithmic impact assessment where there are mandatory external reviews, they are publicly available and um, with opportunity to be challenged by affected parties, independent testing and auditing of algorithms. Um, and the possibly uh, the oversight of a specialized watchdog, uh, redress mechanism, additional obligations for public authorities, for example, when procuring such AI systems, or co-regulation for private parties uh, with industry uh, standards. Um, but at the same time, any new legislation or response will take a number of years to be prepared, passed, adopted, and what I would like to finish is with, just the, with the need uh, to create new agile regulatory tools to monitor the impact of these emerging technologies already today in controlled environment under the supervision of the regulators. And this can be done with regulatory sandboxes. Um, in fact, the Information Commissioner's Officers in the UK has created its first such privacy regulatory sandbox, which allow companies already to innovate and test uh, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, which could combine the two sides uh, of the issue. How do we act post-GDPR? Uh, How companies can really continue and create trustworthy artificial intelligence, but at the same time under the supervision of the regulators, which could monitor, assess the risks, and really inform uh, any, post uh, any future um, legislation. So, I just want to finish my presentation with this food for thought, maybe for you, as this could be an initiative that could be also embraced in the EU and with the member states, national data protection authorities, and it could be given excellent opportunity to combine both the GDPR and the new ethical guidelines and apply them in the context of artificial intelligence and big data and really help to uh, develop and use these technologies in a trustworthy way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Urdanka, for this very, actually, systematic, well-structured overview. And uh, I mean, you, you make a disclaimer, you, you didn't, uh, that you don't delve into, into uh, all the technical details, but I think you, you, you kind of have given a very important proof that lawyers should be, I mean, are should be treated as seriously in this business as, as, as <laughs> artificial intelligence engineers, because I think this is really the, the challenge posed by, uh, by AI. Indeed, you know, requires um, examining so many, let's say, traditional so fundamental right concepts, and uh, and we, we need to, 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 to basically marry, marry this knowledge. Um, so uh, I also, uh, so you, you obviously focus on the risks uh, of, of, AI, of AI in the context of privacy. We are also very much aware of the uh, of the potential that AI uh, offers in terms of being a tool for 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 ensuring uh, cybersecurity uh, and and privacy. That that's in a way a paradox, but that's in, indeed the nature of this technology. Are there any questions or comments to this? Please. Yes, Chiara Mazzone from the Digital Innovation and Blockchain Unit. I've got a specific question for you concerning the uh, risk of re-identification and the impossibility of uh, deleting data in our digital uh, uh, economy mm -hmm. and repurposing this data in many different contexts. So do you think, would you advise, uh, if you were in an advice position, to uh, kind of um, reshape uh, for the enforcement purposes the right, whether the right to be forgotten or other rights, like uh, letting um, people and uh, companies and uh, DPAs understanding that 
This is not possible to erase data all over the places in the digital space. And my second question would be related to more, uh, more directly to new technologies such as blockchain. Uh, because we always see that there are more hindrance or more problems in the application of GDPR when it comes to new decentralized technologies, which have not been foreseen, uh, which GDPR has not uh, foreseen for uh, or was not uh, meant to be working in this kind of decentralized environment. So maybe it's a way to smooth down these uh, tensions, the fact of saying that anyway, our data today in a digital space are not erasable 100%. We keep the principle that we need to be erasing this data if need be, but there are some data that do stay, and there are some data, financial purposes or health records, that do stay forever or for tax purposes. So is it this kind of advice that you will be giving to <laughs> enforcers, or do we have other ways to, to show that there could be further compliance, or we just think uh, post-GDPR, as it was mentioned before by Paul or by other speakers? Uh, yes, thank you very much for for this question, uh, because I've been also looking myself in doing my PhD in this uh, and also advising the companies uh, how to implement it. And uh, what I've taken also from some conferences where I've been uh, is that uh, technology can help also here. Uh, and there is a lot of going on work in the research community, how you could, uh, in fact, uh, ensure that this data is in the end deleted, uh, even with the machine learning or even with blockchain. So I don't think that keeping now the legal obligations in the legislation is uh, we should remove them. No, I think we should keep them there because this gives an incentive uh, for the companies, for the researchers to find the right ways. And there have been a lot of um, new technologies like uh, in, uh, differential privacy, influential privacy, which looks now into ways uh, how this could be uh, implemented uh, and even uh, the data deleted. Uh, that's why in, uh, in the end, I think um, just uh, regulating, experimenting under the supervision of the regulators with this new technology is important because it could give the answers to these questions and it could give uh, uh, some more specific uh, standards or even exceptions in certain areas, uh, which could be in the end not really probably changing the legislation itself, but just uh, giving uh, some advice uh, as sometimes you have trade-offs. Um, uh, between even between the principles, uh, you may have to ensure security and privacy at the same time. Uh, and uh, I think there is some flexibility in the legislation which allows uh, exceptions also even now. But we really have to find the ways to test these new approaches and to find the answers uh, that are in the end protecting uh, sufficiently and implementing the uh, obligations. I think this concerns all these new technologies, including uh, blockchain, uh, and uh, having these obligations gives stimulus uh, to the companies to find the solution. Please. Sandro Delia from the G-Connect. I would like to have your opinion on the legal legal approach that we can have towards the problem of the training data for uh, artificial intelligence. What I mean is this. Uh, nowadays, in neural networks, the algorithms that are used are uh, more or less standard. There are several frameworks, open source, used by everybody. What makes the big difference is the training data that you give to your neural network. So if you write a thing to, to to write text and you give Twitter as input, it becomes uh, racist, uh, uh, sexist, uh, and uh, intolerant, and whatever. If you give a different training set, like, I don't know, our internal uh, community site, it will know everything about the digital technology and probably will be very much pro-European. Uh, the problem, this problem is very clear when you have to deal with artificial intelligence with interact with the physical world. For example, for autonomous driving, now people understand that we need uh, huge data sets to test uh, the, the, the vehicle in, all, in many possible cases. And you, the, the more you have uh, data, the better the test will be. Can 
legal approach be used for this? So require a minimal standard for uh, artificial intelligence applications which take a decision. What could be the approach? Because I don't see, uh, also the high-level expert group uh, does not seem to look exactly at this problem. So mm -hmm. I would like to have your opinion. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, I've so uh, I've seen a, a couple of research papers because also the research community is uh, working a lot on to find uh, uh, really the standards and the answers how we can ensure unbiased in the end uh, artificial intelligence. And from what I've seen, uh, I, I haven't really uh, had still the answer. But I think having uh, having really some obligations about whether this data is uh, representative enough. Uh, of uh, sufficient quality, whether it is accurate, and uh, have uh, some uh, technical uh, measures to to um, to monitor how the algorithm uh, perform uh, in accordance uh, with this data. So we that's why I said we have to have a vigilance all the time whether the initial standards for quality and representativeness of the data uh, are in the end respected. Uh, and um, I could maybe even uh, send a, a really relevant uh, site uh, with uh, research papers on these issues where you could find uh, maybe more uh, standards uh, that could be legally uh, uh, made as a, probably something uh, obligatory for the companies to follow. Thank you very much. If I, I don't see anyone, so we would uh, move now to our last speaker, uh, Roberto uh, Cascella, uh, who is, uh, I mean, who might know actually very well. He is our partner in as a, as a member of the, of, of the team in, in EXO, which is the Industrial Association of Cybersecurity uh, Companies, also our partner, commission partner in the cybersecurity CPPP. Roberto, uh, is also a scientist in, in this domain, and he would share with us uh, his views about, uh, yes, the, the title is really broad, so Trustworthy and Resilient European Cybersecurity Ecosystem. So probably you will speak not only about industry, but, yeah. okay, let's see. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, for the kind invitation. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, clearly, I would like just to give a brief uh, introduction to uh, what is the European Cybersecurity Organization and then what is the link with, uh, uh, with DigiConnect in terms of uh, collaboration that we are having in these years. Uh, and also maybe moving then later to the activities that we are doing. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, so um, some of you, well, clearly might know because we are the counterpart of, uh, of the European Commission with respect to the, uh, to the PPP on cybersecurity. So it's been established in 2016. And uh, I would say that uh, our initial activity was uh, to work on this uh, strategic research innovation agenda to provide input for, uh, uh, for the project. So, and uh, in terms of organization, we started in, with 132 members, and then we are growing, uh, moving more than 250 uh, last June 2019, well, last month. Clearly, with uh, all the different associations that we have in Axel, we reach more than 2,000 organizations. So in, uh, in a sense, uh, we try to convey the messages from uh, both large companies in terms of solution providers, uh, but also end users, uh, uh, different associations with different interests, uh, uh, universities and RTOs, uh, and uh, I would say very important also SMEs, uh, regions, and national public administration. Uh, so uh, clearly, I would like just to delve uh, quickly into the into the topic related to cybersecurity. So before, has been also presented the link between cyber defense and cybersecurity, all the different aspects uh, linked also to our fundamental rights that we need to protect, and then clearly to protect. Uh, not only uh, the economy, but also uh, the citizen uh, with all the uh, uh, privacy aspects uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so on, so an institution. So in EXO, we, we came up with, uh, uh, with a definition, so uh, try to put all these elements together. And uh, so uh, the idea is that we define like European cybersecurity as our common science, knowledge, trustworthy process, products, services, uh, and also infrastructure that uh, are there to protect in a sustainable way our nations, industries, economies, citizens, and institutions. So 
Clearly, we need to protect against uh, damaging cyber attacks, so there is also the resilient part, but we need to respect all the European values and uh, clearly all the fundamental rights that have been like uh, uh, discussed uh, uh, before. For doing this, uh, we are structured like uh, uh, quickly into six working groups. So we're trying to cover not only, I would say, the research and then the strategy uh, proposing uh, a strategy, I would say, for uh, cybersecurity in Europe, but uh, uh, concrete also action that are linked to the industrial policies. So with respect to that, uh, we look at aspects related to certification. This is a, a big uh, also activity linked to the Cybersecurity Act and then supporting clear the implementation of the Cybersecurity Act but uh, also at the market development, what are the, uh, in actually the needs from the market sides and also link it with the international cooperation. So we speak uh, uh, um, with uh, uh, clearly aspects that are linked with, uh, with the third countries outside Europe, with, for instance, US, Japan, and so on, and uh, because cybersecurity has no border, so it's a global issue there. And then also link with the different vertical sectors. Uh, uh, this is not only uh, linked to the needs directed that has been mentioned before, but uh, also driving and collecting the needs from the market, from the different verticals uh, that are important to address uh, for, uh, uh, in terms of technology and so on. Then regions, SMEs that are very important. Uh, and then has been mentioned before about uh, the, cyber, uh, the, the treaty, I mean like scales, and clearly this is one important aspect. This has been also recognized uh, in the communication of 2017, September 2017. Uh, skills uh, training it's, uh, is a key also element with respect to professionals, uh, but also awareness, uh, uh, both in terms of citizen, but also at the sea level uh, uh, with respect to all the different companies. And then clearly working group six, that is, uh, I would say, the research and then uh, the the, well, the talk now is going to more focusing on these uh, aspects. So clearly we'd like to, to define this roadmap to strengthen and build uh, a resilient European uh, uh, ecosystem. So try to address uh, all the different aspects and to support uh, the digitalization of the, both the so so uh, society and the uh, economy. So uh, with respect to that, uh, we came up, uh, I mean, just uh, briefly with the document that is publicly available uh, and uh, that covers, uh, I would say, seven trusts uh, um, with respect to the ecosystem, the application domains, uh, but then it looks into the, how do we manage threats with the collaborative intelligence uh, and uh, how we will look had in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, but also service components and so on. So what I would like to mention here is that uh, all these elements are interlinked. When we look at the different cybersecurity technologies, uh, so clearly they are there to protect infrastructure, the application, the citizen, uh, but uh, also they need to be linked with, uh, as I say, with the different uh, uh, economical uh, sectors. Uh, and that where we have also e governments uh, is one of the sector energy um, transport and so on, but uh, all this needs to be seen also with respect to the cyber ecosystem. Cyber ecosystem that we have also element linking to the training, uh, uh, certification, uh, education, uh, uh, but also when we have all the elements with uh, uh, empowering the humans with new capabilities uh, and so on. So there should be like a more uh, comprehensive approach to address all these, uh, uh, these aspects. And looking into the, let's say, moving forward uh, for what we stand right now, what we have already in terms of uh, uh, public available in, uh, in EXO, so I'll try to move a little bit forward and then discuss uh, our vision, I mean, what we are doing in terms of working for our strategy toward 2027. This is clearly linked with the new uh, policy activities and then action that will be done in terms also of investment in, uh, in research and capability uh, development. So with respect to that, we are also looking at uh, specific technical papers. So as been mentioned, like artificial intelligence, uh, one of the important technologies of the future, try to look uh, what are the, the challenges still there remaining, uh, the link with all the different vertical sectors, but also the link with policy. The same also with the uh, uh, blockchain. There was a colleague uh, there from the blockchain unit. So blockchain clearly has an uh, impact in the transformation uh, of our uh, ecosystem and society. And uh, Internet of Things is not being mentioned, but is uh, the other technology that is, uh, is key because uh, it has uh, numerous impact also on the, on the industry, but also linked with the citizen. We are trying to finalize these three documents, but also looking ahead uh, and then we identified already two aspects. Uh, 
One is about 5G and communication technologies. There is already an action at the European level with the communication in, uh, at the end of March uh, with respect to 5G. The member states are working on it. So we are trying to look at all the different challenges with respect to this domain, but also post-quantum computing. Uh, and then in particular, like the migration aspects that uh, uh, we need to consider when uh, uh, by that vent, by the, by the usage of uh, uh, post-quantum uh, computing and so on. So all these uh, comes into a, a global vision that we are seeing like in, uh, in, um, in our association. So in particular, we have different, uh, different strengths here. So we identify the society and the citizens, so the social good that is one important pillar. Another one is the verticals, digital transformation verticals. That and the economy has been mentioned, like data is, uh, is one of the, the key enabling, uh, let's say, um, aspects to consider for the future. And then clearly all the different technologies. So, so I try to give some uh, highlights of what we think that is important uh, to consider for the, these four topics. So, and with respect to that, we contributed recently to actions with respect to the priorities for Horizon Europe and Digital Europe program. So it's important to consider both investment in research and innovation, but also building up the capabilities. So there need to be like uh, some uh, link, important link between the two. So cybersecurity is also a transversal issue. So, and then we collaborate with different uh, initiatives, so with different uh, also uh, PPPs like uh, um, Industry 4.0, both big data and so on but uh, also uh, uh, touching aspect related to the cybersecurity for dual use technology. And then there is a close link between cybersecurity and cyber defense. Uh, so try to have uh, uh, an, um, a global picture. So in terms of uh, challenges, I try here to, to put some uh, key, I would say, element related to the transformation of our, of our society. So more and more, we are talking about the connected cars at the moment. So all these are uh, autonomous systems uh, that clearly are changing the way uh, we live in. And then it will also have an impact in terms of both technology, but also business models. So, so there is uh, clearly uh, all the um, aspects linked to the constant monitoring of aspects of our life. So we have the implication with uh, uh, social media, but also cameras uh, uh, everywhere. The fact that you know, there are a lot of personal data that are available. So how to use them, how to protect them, and then how to make a value of that. There is also link to the more and more usage of mobile devices. So with uh, battery powered mobile devices that we tend to use more and more also as a clone also of our digital life. 5G networks will have an important also uh, massive uh, usage, not only in terms of uh, cities and let's say changing the life of cities because maybe the citizens might not really see the impact of using 5G technology, but more in terms of verticals uh, and then application domains. IoT, industrial IoT, uh, additive manufacturing, uh, and uh, also the fact that there are going to be more and more critical attacks, uh, uh, cyber attacks to critical infrastructure. So we kind of expecting this uh, uh, cyber uh, Pearl Harbor and uh, um, that there was such like the point uh, before of the, of the fake news. And uh, this is uh, critical because uh, it's been mentioned before the, uh, the fact that cybersecurity will have an impact uh, actually on the democratic process in Europe. Uh, it's been mentioned like the election uh, aspects, uh, but also the way that citizens see the reality. And then uh, it's, uh, uh, so this is a very important uh, aspect. Quantum computers, uh, the massive usage also of the digital twins, replicas, and uh, uh, also, artificial intelligence uh, has been uh, mentioned uh, extensively before. So I would like just, uh, in terms of technology, touching uh, clearly uh, uh, quantum computing and post-quantum computing crypto is, uh, is going to have uh, a say, and there are a lot of initiatives also at the European level uh, about this. AI and cognitive science, uh, again, uh, uh, this is uh, both in terms of using uh, artificial intelligence to protect our system, so as a cyber uh, solution, but also we need to protect uh, AI itself. Uh, and uh, right now we don't see like AI still used uh, for attacking the system, but we might expect that uh, this will come very, very soon to have also uh, uh, attacks that are powered by um, artificial intelligence directly. 5G and new disruptive communication technologies, uh, 
this is another key technology. I was yesterday, you know, this, uh, in, in an event organized also by uh, DigiConnect about 5G. So this uh, has an important impact, a link also with uh, uh, the Internet of Things and then uh, the cyber physical system. Blockchain, distributed ledger technologies, changing not only with respect to the cryptocurrency, but also using different kind of sector and so on. Robots, uh, so this is uh, also linked, I would say, with uh, AI, with artificial intelligence uh, very much, and also the fact that uh, uh, we might have the presence of cyborgs, digital twin, and biotechnology augmented human. So quickly, I would like to mention you know, some of the aspects that we are considering. Uh, so uh, clearly, resilience is, uh, is an important point. So when we touch uh, resilience, so we need to develop a resilient system, touching also uh, in aspects related to the security by design that it needs to be present there just to be prepared also for potential zero-day attacks. So um, it's important to consider like a risk management strategy. And in particular, we don't know what, which kind of attacks we expect in the future. This is important because most of our uh, system infrastructure are built it maybe like uh, with a lifespan of 15, 20 years. Uh, so we might need to face like unknown attacks uh, for the future. So we need to be somehow adaptive also with respect to these aspects. Vulnerability management is uh, key. And this is as a link with uh, also with the certification points. So, so with, the, with the fact that we need to have continuous assessment evaluation because the systems are quite dynamic. There is a huge change there. So it's, it's important to support all these aspects. Clearly, uh, industry requires like a transporty, a transporty supply chain. So this touched both the links with the certification and the assessment, but also the fact that we can also uh, trace uh, uh, where the different products came from. Training is an important point, so with the cyber ranges, uh, and uh, this is a uh, uh, key both with respect to general cyber ranges training, uh, but also uh, specific for the sectors, uh, like finance, healthcare, and so on. Uh, bringing trust in the machine economy, so with more and more we rely on the data with the cyber physical system, so that with IoT that provide the old machine generated data, so we need to look into that. And some cyber augmented humans, so uh, just rely on the technology to protect also uh, the humans and so on. With respect to the infrastructure, I would like uh, clearly there is the issues related to threat intelligence and then situational awareness that are uh, that are key. So we need to uh, design like uh, highly critical, uh, infra highly secure uh, infrastructure, and uh, this is uh, an important uh, an important aspect. When we look then uh, also at the communication for the future, we need to consider that we see right now for the infrastructure, more and more convergence between like 5G, Internet of Things and cloud, uh, and all aspects linked to softwareization, virtualization that are more and more present, uh, bringing uh, solutions, but also new challenges. Uh, and clearly we cannot stop, let's say, the digital transformation, but we can uh, uh, make it, uh, uh, own it, uh, and then uh, look into specific uh, countermeasures and uh, uh, working on the technology to address that. So clearly, security orchestration is important uh, uh, here, and it should not be seen like as a patch, but uh, it should be coupled also with the orchestration of, uh, of the resources that uh, we need to, uh, to consider. Um, with respect to data economy, a few things have been also said, uh, actually not few, a lot has been said uh, before, and then especially when we look at uh, uh, AI, but uh, clearly, Data, it's, uh, uh, it's one of the key drivers for our digital economy. So we see more and more like the link between data and business model. And uh, so there is a need uh, to have new privacy preserving uh, uh, techniques to protect the growth of the economies here. Uh, and uh, also the fact that we need to really verify the correctness of the information uh, and handling fake news. The last point is respect to the different technologies. So, AI with the safe and fair AI mentioned before, trustworthy AI-based system uh, to increase trust also in the decision process, uh, to have also security guarantees uh, in the production chain. So here we look not only at the software, but also at the hardware and the way that the product is deployed and the services are also delivered to the end users. Uh, so we need to look also at trusted electronics here. 
Uh, cryptography has been mentioned before with, uh, for instance, differential privacy. There are also aspects linked to homomorphic encryption, uh, multi-party secure computation. So we need also to consider the fact that we are going to have uh, quantum computing. So we need also to address uh, a post-quantum uh, uh, era. Procedure for secure evaluation. Cryptocurrency with respect to privacy friendly in the sense linked to the transaction still. And then uh, address IoT challenges at all level. Uh, services, uh, um, services, devices, and application, and so on, and to have more uh, cyber-aware adaptive application. So I would like just uh, to link the last point is to uh, that uh, we have we need to have like investment in research and innovation, but also we need to deploy like capabilities. So we look into four different uh, pillars. Uh, one is to support the policy implementation. This is very important because we have a lot of policies that are very good actions that the Commission has taken, so we need to support. And also, has been mentioned before, the NIST directive uh, uh, now, I mean, like uh, uh, member states are looking to that. The same is going to be with respect to the Cybersecurity Act. Uh, so there is work to be done to support the policy implementation, GDPR as well with the post-GDPR and so on. For the technology, so we need to have also tools, both uh, uh, for uh, uh, platforms uh, for the development of, uh, of the technologies, uh, and also looking at uh, the, mark uh, the market uh, aspect, the comp competitiveness there, and uh, skills. This is key aspects to consider with, uh, with the competence building. So this uh, just uh, covers uh, all the different uh, aspects so far. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. I'm with you. Thank you very much, Roberto. I think you, you, you've done really a, a very good job of, of, on the one hand, selling uh, EXO. I, 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 I would, I'm not, you are, we are not necessarily prospective members of EXO, but I definitely encourage you also to, to look on the website and see a variety of different interesting papers that have been produced that represent the views of, of European cybersecurity companies, but also increasingly the users. Of cybersecurity, and I think again, you 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 gave uh, you gave quite a list of, of 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 issues for for let's say reflection for the future for the next college. So uh, thanks a lot for that, and I understand it reflects a sort of collective thinking in in the community at least to some extent, even if it's not an official position of the EXO. Now, any questions to Roberto? Uh, no. Okay. So we have. It's wonderful. We have twenty minutes, and I have a, a, a surprise for you. So imagine, you know, two days, no, three days ago, we have. Um, or someone is leaving, but don't 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 be afraid. You know, uh, three days uh, ago, we have we 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 know now that we have a president elect of the new European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Leyen. I think we will also have to learn. Uh, pronunciation from our German colleagues, and you end up in Berlamo building. You go with her in the lift. She polite. She politely asks you, "What do you work on?" You answer, "Cybersecurity." Perhaps you can add privacy. So, what would be the one thing you would like to tell her? You know, she's the new Commission president. She's likely to be a you know to become the new Commission president after the vote of the Parliament. Yeah, and you want to convey, again, not the long list of Roberto, because you don't have a time for it, but just one thing that you would like the new Commission President to know. So I'll start with the panel. So, who would like to start? Paul. Paul. Me first? Yeah. Well, but one, one thing, okay. you know. Okay, well, I already, uh, I, I, I have addressed that in, in my but remarks. now you have to choose what you need to Well, I'm going to actually say something else. Um, if I had only one thing to say to her, it would be this, uh, be bold. Uh, because policies are invariably only ever watered down, um, and it's the role and job of the European Commission president to push for something that's ambitious uh, and work for it, something that, as I said in my opening remarks, makes sense. You, we don't need crazy ideas, but we need, we need ideas that are bold and ambitious. That would be my advice, is be bold and use your political capital that you have now. Use it now, uh, because it will only dwindle. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's in an elevator, and I only have ten seconds. No, uh, you want minute. I think I'll that minute. Um, my my advice would be to put a lot more 
emphasis on the whole security side of her sort of com commission ambitions and, you know, to look through, do they have a comprehensive way of protecting the union? If her answer to that is yes, look once again. Uh, well, um, my advice uh, probably would be uh, indeed be bold, be very forward looking because even the challenges we see today are changing and uh, we see that we are a bit going behind, I think, and we must be really forward looking how to transform our societies, our policies as well. Uh, to respond because I don't think that uh, GDPR will be sufficient to, uh, to really uh, help with this data-driven economy and there are many also uh, concerns, for example, how really to, to make it work. Uh, but there is a lot to be coming uh, also in the future. And I think what is also very important, uh, probably because I've been a lawyer advising companies and many stakeholders how to implement all these regulations that are indeed needed, uh, but just provide the tools to the companies when you think of, uh, of the new obligations. Uh, because um, I think this is really needed uh, and uh, a lot of uh, work and money could have been saved uh, just if there have been really technologies and uh, much more, um, how to say, um, tools for the companies to implement them in practice in a real practical way. Um, and I think this would give a positive side also for the citizens uh, that uh, EU is not, uh, uh, is not just uh, creating regulations, uh, but really making it work in the end. Thanks a lot. You, you made her even stop to, to listen for longer. Good. Yes. Uh, so I've, it's been mentioned before, so I would just say that uh, cybersecurity is a needs a cross-domain approach. Uh, because uh, it has uh, impacts in different uh, uh, aspects of our society. Uh, so it's been mentioned, I mean, like to be, uh, to be bold and clearly not one single stakeholder or entity can address that, but we need to work like in a, in a more cohesive system. So it's important to really strengthen the European community and to face cybersecurity, because if we don't address that, a lot of technologies might not work and also uh, the industry, I would say, will face problems, governments, and so on. Thank you very much. I, I would really like to perhaps encourage some of you to, 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 to share with us. I mean, I'm, I'm doing also for selfish reasons, you know. We have our briefings ready, but there is always push for more. So perhaps it, could, it, could be, it doesn't have to be something so generic, but something also very concrete, which is related to your work. So feel free, please. Well, <clears throat> I would ask that A, she thinks about liability in the software uh, engineering sector, because that's a big manco. Basically, if you look at it from a risk uh, management perspective, I mean commercial business risk management perspective, there needs to be a counterweight which provides a benefit if you proactively improve the security of your products. And the second thing is we actually need um, savvy people. So not people uh, who are solely cyber aware, but who are able to reason about their situation. And for that, they need a clear conceptual understanding of the field of safety, security, as such, disconnected from ICT, and then have a conceptual architectural base knowledge about what is going on. And I hope that this would actually incite some interest in what is going on, because right now we're lacking incentives for people to get cyber savvy in this sense. Thanks a lot, very useful. Please. Just to, to follow up on what the colleague said, I, I think, and Paul said in the beginning, we are a political organization, but what we sell has to make sense to a lot of people. So we need more and more information and education on all these questions. We need, you know, training on schools, we need skills, like you said, skills. I was, I, I work for DG Employment on the skills unit. Your idea, Paul, is very bold to change the treaty just to put skills into the treaty. I will take this to my director. For sure. So we need to, in in order to 
to, to have political support, popular support for these measures, we need to have much more uh, uh, raising awareness of, of all these questions to the citizen. If not, we will not go anywhere. You know, so more, so more investment in training, not only in skills but on information in schools, training centers for people to understand this because we we need to have support for this. You know. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to share? Please. It is also maybe about the consequence, being conscient about the consequence of, uh, I would say, attacks or um, issues uh, companies, for example, could meet. I have worked for several sectors of uh, the industry, and I must say that from a sector to another sector, the uh, relationship to security is completely different. So within ELF, we are uh, really conscious that if something happens, it might, um, I would say, attempt to uh, the health of people. But for banks, they are not killing people. So the uh, attitude towards security is completely different. And I think that maybe uh, from a regulatory point of view, there is also a need of enforcement of security rules. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Uh, if no, no more. Uh, so let's maybe applaud once again our panelists. Um, I would like to thank you very much for uh, for anyway, bringing uh, to us you know different perspectives uh, for the future. We re it is really now time when the agenda of the of the new commission will be shaping up. So I would say we we definitely need uh, all those external inputs. I hope you uh, enjoyed the session and. Some of you, of course, were more than in one session of Connect uh, uh, Summer University. So that was the last session. And uh, I hope you take with you, let's say, good things, uh, let's say, home, back to your work. And uh, if you uh, ever want, you know, to, to come up with, with ideas, discuss with us, don't, don't, please don't hesitate uh, to contact me, my, uh, my team. And the same goes for a unit of Miguel uh, H1. And then we have now only two persons, I think, in the room. We have Anders here, who is in my team. And I saw Domenico. Uh, yes. OK. So once again, great thanks. And uh, have a nice weekend and safe trip home. Thanks. Thank you for keeping us safe. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Yes, yes, thanks. thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I, this one has my notes all over it, so you can ah. ignore those, but uh, if you don't mind, um, yeah. just because I reread it.